May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. How many times does something have to happen for it to stop being a coincidence? Have you often had that sense of sort of weird deja vu where something seems to be happening again and again and you're sure you've been here before? There's that catchy little tune that seems very familiar but then changes into something slightly different and you're pretty certain that a composer's stolen it from somewhere but you can't put your finger on where. Or that annoying actor who turns up in everything and you spend half the episode of the TV trying to work out what it was they were in that you remember them from. All sorts of things crop up again and again. And the Bible is no different. Our passage this afternoon is littered with examples of that. It plays with all sorts of ideas from elsewhere in the Bible to make an important point about special people in the Bible. How again and again they're identified by God to save his people. But the truly remarkable thing is that our introduction today to probably the most famous of the judges, Samson, actually points to something completely different. Because it underlines how Jesus is our perfect judge. How he makes each one of us a special character in his own great story. Let's dig in. This is week eight of our Judges series. And once again, we have multiple judges to skip through quickly. Last week, we looked at that terrible story of Jephthah's daughter. Of the man's absurd promise to God. And this week, we're setting up for our 12th and final judge who is by far the most famous. There's more written about him than anyone else. Before him, there are three sort of bit part judges, Ibsan, Elon and Abdon. There isn't much to say about them, apart from that it shows that Jephthah didn't leave much of a legacy. There are three judges in just 25 years. And while we've got used to having a new prime minister every five weeks at the moment, (laughs) for Israel, that was unusual. Clearly, things weren't very stable. They were churning over really quickly. They also seem to have had lots of children, in contrast with Jephthah, who went before, who only had a single daughter, and the family that we're about to meet. Our passage opens with that familiar formula, Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but now there is a different enemy. No longer is it the Ammonites, it is the Philistines. There are mysterious sort of people who arrived from the sea, and nobody's quite sure where they came from. It was probably Greece, but it might have been further afield. And they established a powerful group of five city-states on the west coast. We've come to expect a sort of routine cycle of oppression, appeal, repentance, and then God delivering Israel. But that's not what happens here. Israel have given up. There is no plea to be set free. After 40 years, they've just got used to the idea that the Philistines are in charge. It is God who steps in. Israel have given up. They're not calling out to God. It is God who calls out to them. And it is to the family of this man, Manoah. And his name is really interesting. It means restful place. But it can mean that in a positive way, like going on holiday for a nice rest. Or it can mean it in a negative way, in the sense of having just given up, having just put your feet up and accepted there's nothing you can do. And I think that's what it's talking about here, that Israel have just given up, that they are now resting in the Philistine lands. But it's not to a man that the angel of the Lord appears, to a woman, to Manoah's wife, who sadly remains nameless. And it's interesting, from this point on in Judges, the stories revolve more and more around women. And even when they're not the main character, it is their actions and particularly their suffering that move the story forward. I think it's a feature of when society starts to break down, it's so often the women who suffer. When their protections are removed, when there is no consequence for evil, it is women who suffer. And that's what we're going to see over the next few chapters. The angel of the Lord appears to Mrs. Manoah, in search of a better name, and is very blunt. You are childless, you will become pregnant, and your child will be special. They will be a Nazarite. Now, I'm sure you all regularly read the book of Numbers. It's it's gripping from start to finish. But chapter 6 in particular 
talks about the rule and role of the Nazarite order. Normally, for a period of time, maybe two or three years, Israelites would dedicate themselves to the Lord. They would take a sort of special vow to serve the Lord with particular care. Think of it a bit like being a nun or a monk. But it was always time-bounded, only for two or three years, and their hair was a symbol that they were undergoing this vow. When the vow was finished, they would shave it off. Samson is to be different. He is to be a Nazarite his entire life. And with this wonderful, this amazing news, Mrs Manoah rushes off to find her husband, who, being a typical man, doesn't believe a word, she says. But I do love her description of the angel. Very awesome. It's the same in the Hebrew. There's this desperate sense of trying to explain how incredible this person they've just met was and having no words that do it justice. Manoah decides that he wants some sort of confirmation that what his wife has told him is too fabulous to be true. And so when the angel of God returns, it's not to Manoah. It is still to his wife that the angel appears and Mrs Manoah runs off to go get her husband and bring him back. And thankfully, Mrs Manoah is above I told you so's and brings Manoah to speak to this person. Manoah asks for some advice. How are they to raise this amazing child? And essentially gets told exactly the same things that his wife was told. She knew what needed to be done. <coughs> Manoah asks the angel to stay for dinner, which was, you know, important ancient Near Eastern hospitality. But bizarrely, the angel declines. Refusing hospitality in the Middle East is quite rude. It's unusual. It's a sign of disrespect. Manoah, perhaps confused, asks who this person is. What is your name? And the angel responds, not with Gabriel, not with Michael or anything like that. With a very difficult to translate phrase. A lot of Bibles put it as, it is beyond understanding. Or it is, as here, it does here, it is wonderful. But I think a better translation might be, it is beyond wondering. This is no ordinary angel. And apparently, taking this in his stride, Manoah prepares a goat. He pops it on the rock and fire blazes towards heaven. This is supposed to remind us of Gideon and his sacrifice with another mysterious angel angelic figure. Only now does Manoah realise what's happened, that it has been special, that they are doomed to die. And ever practical, Mrs Manoah reminds him that, well, if they were going to die, why on earth did the angel turn up in the first place? And she's right. She gives birth to a bouncing baby boy, Samson, whose name means little son. He was supposed to bring light to his people. Well, we'll have to wait until next week to find out how that goes. Not well. <laughs> Hopefully, as we walk through that story, you spotted some similarities with other Bible stories. There are lots of things that feel vaguely familiar. As I've just said, most recently, that story of Gideon meeting the angel of the Lord. There's a meal, there's fire. There's a sudden realisation that they've met somebody quite important. But the whole story here feels very familiar. Does it remind any of you of any other birth prophecies in the Bible? Yes. Sorry? Annunciation. The Annunciation to Mary, yeah. Birth of Jesus. Yes. Any others? John the, Baptist. John the Baptist. Very good. Yes. There's a couple more. Old Testament. Um, Hannah. Hannah. Hannah and Elkanah. Yes. That's a good one. Moses. Moses is a little different. There is no prophecy that Moses will be born, but he is born in weird circumstances. And he does have a strange encounter with a voice that speaks in a fire. So mm -hmm. there's definitely a, a link there. There's one more. Abraham, thank you. Abraham. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, so Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. And if you remember, Abraham and Sarah are like beyond antique. They're really old. And she laughs as these three angels talk about the fact that she will have a child. And the child is special. The child is blessed by God. The child leaves a big legacy. Then think of... Hannah and Elkanah, if you remember the story, it's Hannah goes to the temple and begs for a child. And Eli, the priest, thinks she must be drunk. She's beside herself. Something's not quite right. And she says, no, no, I'm just desperate. I'm praying to the Lord. And Eli says, well, may the Lord grant you what you ask for. And he does. But she gives the child back. 
That's the amazing. The child is dedicated for their whole life and becomes that wonderful priest and prophet, Samuel. Then John the Baptist. We've got Zachariah and Elizabeth. Again, fabulously old, but God somehow still does something special. And like Samson, they are to be dedicated for their whole lives to the Lord. It's the very same instructions about avoiding wine, not cutting your hair. And John the Baptist leaves a wonderful legacy. Jesus describes him as the greatest person ever born. But even then, he falls foul of a nasty king and loses his head in unfortunate circumstances. But then finally, Jesus. Again, a very unlikely circumstance. A young woman this time, unmarried, but still has a baby. The dove descends on him as his cousin, John, baptises him in the river. All these stories share a similarity. There's this sort of common idea that's coming up again and again and again when God does something special. Unlikely parents, often old or just unmarried, they're told they will have a child. There's an angel involved somehow. There are prophecies. The child is born. They have a special anointing from God. And normally that's where things go astray, at least for Samson, for John, for Isaac, for Samuel. These stories help show the consistency of God, that God is always trying to reach his people in amazing ways. But they also show something special about Jesus, because all of these miraculous births ultimately go off the rails. Isaac was an adulterer. Samuel didn't train his sons properly. John the Baptist did a brilliant job, but lost his head. And then we get to Jesus. Well, on the surface, he too ended up nailed to a cross. But we know that's not the end of the story. He rose again. Because Jesus is the ultimate judge. He had a very similar start to Samson, but he ended it perfectly. And in doing so, he changed the rules completely. Because one of the defining features of all these special characters with their special birth stories is that God was with them in a really powerful way. He gave them insight. He gave them knowledge. For Samson, he gave them incredible strength. But at Pentecost, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit on all his believers. No longer is the Holy Spirit limited to these special figures, but it dwells within each and every Christian. You don't need octogenarian parents, an angelic visitation or lots of hair to do something amazing for God. Each of us has that same Holy Spirit that empowered the judges living in us because of what Christ has done, because of our perfect judge, because of our belief in him. So this week, in a sort of brief interlude between the terrible story of Jephthah's daughter and the misery that Samson will unleash on everyone he meets, let's be encouraged that God doesn't just work through special superheroes, but that he works through all of us. We all share that same empowering Holy Spirit. So how can you serve him this week? How can you use the gifts, the talents, the time, the resources he has given us for his glory? How can we show his light to a world that needs it more than ever. Amen.